Okay, well, you can see, you can go on and on about things American. The vast majority of the, this information is included in the Root Information Manual, which is, of course, part of the Operations Manual of British Airways, therefore is something that you ought to know. It always gives me a link, if you like, from there, to go into fuel policy. And I'd like us to picture ourselves at New York, we're coming home to London, and we've got Cirrus fuel on board with Gatwick. So the question I ask is, when can I use contingency? And the guys will immediately come back and say, any time the aircraft is in flight. Definition of in flight, the air navigation order, is when the aircraft first moves its own power. So, we started the engines, we pushed back, and we taxi out into a queue. And the question is now that I've used all of my contingency, can I go fly? Answer yes. As we just said, you can use contingency any time after flight begins. Great. But it's a long queue, and I'm now starting to eat into trip fuel. Question. Can I go flying? Answer any group, a mixture of yes and no. And the answer is yes. And in simple terms, in simple terms, the ops manual says that at any time the aircraft is in flight, you must be satisfied that it has sufficient fuel to get to a place, divert to another place and land with reserve fuel. So the question is, does it matter where A is? No. Does it matter where B is? No. So if I can't make London with Gatwick in my scenario at New York, then I might well be able to make Shannon with Cork, and I can certainly make Montreal with Gander. And you can see that because I am in flight, having used my contingency, providing I've got enough fuel to get to a place, divert to another place, and land with reserve fuel, I may go flying in accordance with the operations manual. And of course, because I've never been able to tell the future, hence I'm standing here and not sitting on a beach having won the lottery, I don't know what the winds, actual winds, are going to be. I'll anyway be lighter, so the fact that I can make Shannon with Cork doesn't necessarily mean that I won't be able to make London in due course. Contingency is available for use any time after the aircraft moves under its own power. I must always show enough fuel to get to a place, go to another place, land with reserve. And that remains the case, remains the case until I get within two hours of a destination, the destination that I'm going to use. So, question, at two hours out, have you ever had an EAT, an expected approach time? No, never. Have you ever had the anticipated or expected delay, expected delay. No, never. At two hours out, I can continue to A without that fuel to get to B, providing it's got two runways. Landing assured, landing assured I'm going to come back to. Okay. Two runways. Provided I take into account anticipated delays. So coming into London, let's say it's blowing a southwesterly gale, you can anticipate, what, 20 or 30 minutes? I don't know. Your guess goes mine because of the landing rate being slow due to the high wind. That is an anticipated delay. It's a delay using your intelligence, your knowledge, your skill of the time of day you're coming in to a destination. You're taking into account anticipated delay. Finally, it's got two runways. They needn't be at the same airport. They could be adjacent. 
uh, Heathrow will do for the second runway at Gatwick, or let's say Liverpool for Manchester, and so on and so forth. Once you do have an EAT, right, so that was EAT no, and expected delay no, okay, once you do have an EAT, or an expected delay, right, then you only need one runway. And I think, from a practical point of view, that means to say that you're in the hole at Bobbington and London goes down single runway. Okay. Uh, it's, I suppose London's a bad example because you've got Stansted and Gatwick, but, but you, you, get the, you get the feeling. Really, you're having two runways out there so that if somebody doesn't clear, uh, you've got somewhere else to go and always landing with a minimum of reserve. And any time you think that you're not going to land with reserve, it's pam pam, pam pam, pam pam. Any time you know, mayday, mayday, mayday. Okay. Now, what does that mean? I'll tell you what it means to me. It means that in Bobbington, at Bobbington, in the hole at Bobbington, we have a fuel on the bottom of the ICAS where we are going to leave Bobbington. We are going to leave Bobbington either because we've been invited or because I have told them we are coming. Pam, 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 or mayday, mayday, mayday. It's a fuel which will allow a normal approach into 27 left and a little bit in my back pocket just in case, just in case even though I've told them I've got no go around facility the guy in front screws up and for me on a 747 that's a normal approach 1500 kilos, 500 kilos in my back pocket rounded up and so I'm going to agree with my co pilot the fuel below which we will not go. We will not go. Now that doesn't mean to say that whilst we're in Bobbington we're not discussing other things. Maybe the weather's worse than we thought. Or well, let's go into Stansted, let's say, but break off or, or do something else. But it is a bottom line position when we're going to take positive action, positive cast iron action to get ourselves on the ground with no less than reserve fuel. No less than reserve fuel. Now in these circumstances, if you think about every single flight ever predicated, you are expected to fly to your destination having used up all your contingency, bounce off decision height, fly to the alternate and land with reserve. And basically, by using the parameters that are available to us, we are getting in the position where we're going to land that destination, which is after all where the car's parked, if it's London, or where our customers want to get to if it's New York, with no less than reserve fuel on board. Okay, landing assured. Landing assured when we look in flying crew orders says that in the opinion of the captain, Landing is assured given a single plausible failure of air or ground equipment. For most of the places we go, they will um, certainly have ground equipment that's going to offer you Cat 2 or better. So, I think in terms of what is a plausible single failure of airborne equipment in making my decision about whether landing is assured or not. Now, the way in which I phrase this question really shades the answer. What is a plausible single failure of airborne equipment? And in simple terms, because as we've agreed, I'm just a simple airman, anything in the cure rate is a plausible failure. Because if it's not plausible, it wouldn't be there. So, if in the QRH there is something that will blow away my capability 
or CAT 2 or CAT 3 approaches, then I ain't going to commit my aeroplane landing assured to somewhere that's below CAT 1. Why? Because a single hydraulic failure blows it away, as indeed do many other things within the QRH. What you do on your aeroplane is down to you. But this prudent captain will not commit an aeroplane below cap one. Okay, I'd like to just take a moment to summarise just a couple of things uh, about this approach to fuel policy. Coming into London, busy time in the morning, his sector, I'll say to him, or he'll have said to me, we've got 20 minutes with Gatwick. Puzzle, I'll say to him. Well, Logs. Um, how would you get into Gatwick this time in the morning? He thinks about it for a moment, catches on. I'd have to say pam 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 or mayday mayday. Answer, if you're going to say that, why would you be landing at Gatwick? Why won't you land on 27 right? 27 left was the operational runway. After all, that's where your cars park. In other words, that part of the descent briefing that requires a plan, in my view, requires an operational plan. Something that you could literally take off the shelf and put into action. And if you think about it in those terms, then that means to say that you haven't got 20 minutes with Gatwick, you've probably got 40 minutes with reserve fuel. Whatever. Here we are talking about how close you, Commander, are going to go to the edge of a steel box, a cobalt chromium steel box. It's that hard. Okay, and how close you will go depends on the destination, the crew, your experience, the weather, and 101 other things that pertain to your particular flight on that day. And the fuel figure that I use off the top of my head to get into London out of Bobbingdon will be a completely different fuel figure if I was holding a Calverton going into New York, particularly if they're landing northeast. Because we know that if you're going to land on the 04s, then you're going to go halfway, if not three quarters of the way, to Atlantic City at 1500 feet gulping fuel like no tomorrow. So in this fuel policy, what we are providing, what the operations manual provides you is flexibility to a point that you can use comfortably so that you never land with less than reserve, but it gives you the best opportunity to arrive in the destination that you want. Well, at some point during this discussion about operational awareness, um, I like to pose the question of how low can you go? So the minimum operating altitude varies depending on what part of the flight you're in. But let's say we're at cruise, <coughs> in cruise, and I say to you, what is the minimum operating altitude currently? And you will say it's scrub around and find the MSA. And I said, well, where do you find the MSA? And you'll say from the Cirrus. So if we think about the Cirrus, what's the bandwidth? The bandwidth of the Cirrus is plus or minus 20 miles. That means to say that for almost all direct routings, Cirrus will not apply. But it seems to me incumbent on you, Commander, and indeed your co-pilot to have a chart out so that you can get the MSA from where? Yes, indeed, the grid box. So that you can put your finger on the chart and say, I'm about there, and my MSA off the chart is whatever it is. So, thinking about Greenland, let's say, most of Greenland, the chart is going to say 12,000. It's actually going to say 12.8. And I'm going to ask the question, what's that? Is it a flight level or is it an altitude? 
course, the answer is it's an altitude. So I pose the question like this. If you ever need an MSA, are you going to need it fast? Answer, probably yes. If you're going to need it fast, are you able, are you likely to be able to get a local Q&H? And in many of the sparsely populated areas of the world, the answer is no. So in those sorts of circumstances, if you think about the lowest Q&H, or a low Q&H, that you've seen along the way, what would be a sensible number to add to that? And I come up with a view of about 1,000 feet. So my 12.8 has become 13.8 just because I don't have the Q&H. If I'm over the Greenland or over the Himalayas, is the air likely to be cold? Answer, yes, if it's cold, we know that the altimeter overeats, and it overeats by percentage. For practical purposes, cold air, cold air, what am I going to add? Well, because I'm simple, I'm going to add another thousand feet. And of course, if the wind blows, which it generally does over 20 knots, there's over 50 knots, sorry, then I'm going to add 2,000 feet to cater for that. So you can see that my 12.8 has actually turned into 16.8 on my altimeter. Because if I need an MSA during the cruise, I will need it fast. And what I don't want to do is to come down and put the aeroplane on a piece of cumulative granite. So basically, basically what I'm doing is mentally ensuring that the aeroplane will remain safe and then if I need to refine that or when I'm down at 16,800 then I can probably get a Q&H, I can assess whether the, um, the uh, air is cold or not and of course I can make uh, an interpretation of the wind readout and decide whether I need that 2,000 or not. But it's a way of thinking about an MSA to make it a prudent minimum operating altitude. So then, following on from our discussion of the minimum safe altitude, let's decide how we can get down to our destination. Because we're up, if we're up at 35,000 feet, obviously the lowest um, altitude we can fly is minimum safe altitude sort of discussed what might be a prudent minimum safe altitude given the conditions. So we've got to maintain MSA until when? Well, until we're within 25 miles of our destination, provided, provided that we do not make undue reliance on a single nav aid and we can then come down to a sector safe altitude or the minimum safe altitude for the airport depending on what is published for that particular airport. And if it's a sector safe altitude, we can come down to that sector safe altitude providing we take account of an adjacent altitude or adjacent sector, rather, should it be necessary to do so. So somewhere that's abutting a mountain, for instance, may have very high um, sector safe altitudes, let's say from west to east, and very low because they're at the sea from uh, east through south uh, to west. Now, if you're coming in along or close to the east-west boundary, then the implication of the operations manual says that you've got to take account of the sector safe altitude that's looking after the mountain. So we're going to keep the MSA until we're within 25 miles of the destination airport when we're going to be able to come down to the sector safe altitude, providing, as I say, that we're not making undue reliance on a single nav aid. Unlikely in this day and age, but it's something to be thought about. And how are we going to get down from there? Well, we're going to use a published approach procedure. Now this assumes IMC. So 
assumes that you cannot see. So MSA, Sex Safe Altitude, Published Approach Procedure. <clears throat> We're smiling and say, what is a published approach procedure? Well, it's a black line on an ARAD chart for us. Black line on an ARAD chart. There's somewhere to start from to get us down on the instrument approach to uh, a runway. So that's how we're going to get down in IMC. So the question is, and I've put, I'm just putting radar to one side for a moment because I'm going to come back to it. The question is, can we come down visually? Answer yes. By day and by night. By day is simple. We're just going to use logic. We're just going to keep the aeroplane away from obstacles. Now, it could be that you can see the ground. Great. It could be that there's a layer of cloud and you can keep the aeroplane above the cloud, you know, a big steeple or mountain that's stuck up through the cloud. Well, clearly, you can fly around it. So, logically, by day, you can keep the aeroplane safe. By night, however, there is a different requirement. And by night, you can come down below MSA visually, provided, provided that the line of flight is the line of sight towards a known lit area, generally the runway itself. And, and it's the most important and, you check off your distance against height, against something, i.e. a DME. Now, to make this live, um, so that you'll never forget the reason why, years ago a crew was taking a 747 into Kuala Lumpur and the guys could see, it was a lovely night, they could see the runway and they drove it down the approach. When they got on the ground they found that they got branches and twigs and things in the gear and in the engine intakes. And what had happened was that they had hit the top of a hill, very gently, happily, on the way down. And of course, if you think about our aeroplane, well, the gear is a long way below the line of sight. And so, clearly, there was a need to amend the operations manual in the way that I have said. So it's generally towards the runway itself. But in any event, an identifiable lit area, identifiable lit area, generally the wrong way itself, and, and, and you must be able to check off your height against distance. I said I'd come back to radar because when you read the operations manual, it says that you can uh, come below MSA under radar, but it says a number of things. Firstly, I think we should agree who has ultimate responsibility for keeping the aeroplane clear of the ground. And that's so bloody obvious it almost doesn't need mentioning. It is you, Commander. You have the ultimate responsibility. So if somebody says descend to 5,000 feet when you're coming into Joburg, then it is up to you to refuse it. But what it really says in the Ops Manual is that you can accept a radar approved, radar clearance already, to an altitude from an approved radar. Now, nowhere in the Ops Manual that I can find does it describe what an approved radar is. And so, from a pragmatic point of view, what I think it means is it's approved by me approved by you, I, which I'm, um, I mean that, look, when I come into the UK and they identify me because I've squawked or they tell me that I'm 100 miles southeast of whatever, and I can say to myself, yep, yeah, that's me, then they've got me positively identified. And I don't have any problem about the United Kingdom being an approved radar head. Similarly, if they've watched me and passed me from uh, controller to controller all the way across the United States, then I think it's perfectly reasonable that if San Francisco drops me below my MSA under radar, and I know where I am, then I'm 
more than happy to accept that. When Nairobi tells me I'm radar identified, I take absolutely no notice whatsoever. And I think probably that's the most pragmatic way of looking at the approved radar head. So you've got to be positively identified, yeah, that's me, and you've got to be under an approved radar, i.e., is it sensible? Are they um, a reasonable bunch of people, controllers? Will they have the appropriate equipment? Will it stay switched on? And if you're in the Western world or you know developing areas of the world that have clearly got good radar, fine. But if there's any doubt, any doubt at all, you commander, you commander will say no thanks. Air traffic control, we've said, provide a service. They provide a service to you. So if you feel or you're uncomfortable about the altitude you've been cleared to, decline it. Obviously tell him because of course he might be descending somebody on top of you. Okay. So that gets us down either under IMC or VMC uh, to um, an instrument approach. However, we can do a visual approach. And if we're going to do a visual approach, it's quite important that we understand what the parameters of the operations manual require of us. Right, these parameters are so important that I'm usually I'm actually going to read what it says. Because you must be absolutely under no doubt whatever under what circumstances you can below, go below um, circling minimum if circling minima apply, or the decision at altitude height if you were doing a visual approach following an instrument approach. And the Ops Manual says that for a visual approach before you are established on the extended centre line, before you are established on an extended centre line, sufficient visual reference of the terrain and Either the approach lights or the runway itself must be continuously in view, continuously in view, to ensure terrain clearance. There is an exception, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Once you're on the extended scent line, then the approach or runway lighting or runway itself must be continuously in view. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, for one thing, it means that you can't do a visual circuit in the older simulators where there's a cut-off because when you're going downwind, you lose sight of the approach lights and the runway, and it must be continuously in view. So if it's not continuously in view, you've got to discontinue the, the approach. That means to do a go-around. And you've got to get the airplane up to an altitude that makes it safe, which may well be a sector safe altitude, or it may be if you're um, back up to circling minima if you're within the particular um, area of the approach where the um, circling minima applies, as you should be if you're on a visual approach. So on the extended centre line you've got to be able to see the approach lights, the runway lights or the runway itself. Before that, you've got to see sufficient of the terrain and the approach lights or the runway itself to make sure that the airplane remains safe. Now, the one exception, and there is an exception to this, is in the event that you have a visual approach chart. So, amongst the air ad plate, the air drone plates, there may well be a visual approach chart. There is, for instance, for getting into the Seychelles. From memory, the uh, approach that the, we do is an ILS onto runway 31 with a break off to the right to come round onto the reciprocal 13. And as you break right, you lose sight of the runway because there are mountains, well, uh, hills anyway, on the islands that are in the bay. And the visual approach chart gives you tracks uh, to take you around safely, uh, 
uh, around the bay outside of these islands and brings you on to an extended base leg when you can pick up the runway itself and then get yourself back on the extended centre line. So in the event that you have a visual approach chart and you can comply with the requirements of the um, circling minima in this case, then you can continue on the visual approach having lost sight of the runway or the approach lines. But that's the one exception, one exception. Now why am I making a big deal about this? Well, the reason is we've had many incidents over the years where the guys and girls have lost sight of the runway or the approach lines and got themselves into a mess. And it's not something that, again, that you're going to look up when you're flying the visual circuit. You need to know. You need to know. And the basic position is if you lose sight, you go. If you lose sight of the runway or the approach lines, you go. Because that is what will keep the operation safe. Now that begs the question that if you're doing a shuttle, let's say in, uh, um, in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, during the day there'll be bubbly clouds blowing up here and everywhere, but essentially perhaps the weather's good. So the question is, do you plan to do a visual approach or do you plan to do an instrument approach? Now I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll plan to do the instrument approach. And the reason is this, that until you get within the environs of the airport, you won't know whether you're going to lose sight of the runway when you're downwind or when you're positioning yourself by virtue of the cloud that's there or thereabouts. So it seems to me to make more sense you know, from a, a gambling point of view to do the instrument approach, which theoretically may take a couple of minutes more, but is better than having to plan for a visual approach and do a go-round and then have to navigate myself back to a position where I can do the instrument approach, which I could have done in the first place. Again, I'm not suggesting that that would be necessarily the thing to do if I could see the airport from 100 miles and uh, it's clearly very good weather and I can do a visual approach should I so wish. But I'll go back to the parameters, particularly affecting long haul, where essentially everybody is out of practice. Where if we hang those positions in the sky that I talked about at the very start of this presentation, then maybe, maybe that visual approach isn't as seductive as it might have been if I was flying a short haul aeroplane where I'm in practice and where I love to fly right on the edge of the envelope because not only can I but also can my mate can as well. But whatever you decide to do, know what the requirements are. Know what the requirements are because if you lose sight of the runway or the approach lines and you're on a visual approach and are not following and you are not following a visual approach type you must go round you must discontinue the approach and get the aeroplane to an altitude that you know is safe depending on where you are within the pattern I think in operational awareness we just should take a moment to cover what the air navigation order says about your responsibility commander with regard to weather minimum. I'm going to come back to this in when I talk about route flying but just for this purpose I'm going to read you an extract. Now, the air navigation order article 38 says that an aircraft to which this article applies, I, we've already said it would be a aircraft shall not commence a flight at a time when the cloud ceiling or RVR, or RVR at the 
aerodrome of departure is less than the relevant minimum specified for takeoff. That's what the AANO says. Now, British Airways has elected to say that the commander can always override um, reported RVR, and some people interpret that that you could pop out onto the end of 27 left and say that's not 100 metres, that's um, or that's not 75 metres, that's 125 metres and go. Well, I think that until that's tested in law, the more prudent approach is that you're given 100 metres and you go out and you have a look and you say that's not 100 metres and you decline to go. What you do, down to you. Goes on to say, according to the information available to the commander, the information available to the commander, it would not be able to land at the airdrome of intended destination at the estimated time of arrival there, and at any alternate airdrome at any time at which, according to reasonable estimates, the aircraft would arrive there without contravening the following. Now, Again, let's put that into simple terms. You've got to have weather at the destination and an alternate. Notice the ANO says a destination and alternate. It does not say two alternates. Destination and an alternate. And the weather must be an aircraft when making descent to an aerodrome shall not descend from a height of a thousand feet or more above the aerodrome to a height less than a thousand feet above the aerodrome if the relevant RVR at the aerodrome is at a time less than the specified minimum for landing. Something we're so familiar with, aren't we? You come down to a thousand feet above the aerodrome, if the RVR is below minima, you do not go below a thousand feet, you go round from there. Now, it also says it shan't make a descent to an aerodrome, blah, 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 uh, not continue an approach to landing by flying below the relevant specified decision height or altitude unless the specified visual reference for landing is established and maintained. So in those cases, without an RVR, if you lose sight of the air, um, the, the runway, if you like, or the approach lights, whatever is required for the appropriate approach, then you have to go round. And that's what the ANO says. Contrast that with flying course, you can see shades of difference. Now, I'm not going to say which is right, I'm just going to say that that's what the ANO said. And when we talk about route flying, we're going to come back to this process of you, the commander, ticking off mentally the fact I can get out of here, yeah, because the RBR is above minimum, I can land there because it's above uh, the, or forecast to be, above the weather minima for the destination and I can go to the alternate because the weather minima is above that um, requirement for the alternate including the increments that are necessary in accordance with our operations manual so that if it can offer CAT 2 or CAT 3 then the alternate must be able to offer you CAT 1 which begs the question you know what the alternates are able to offer you in terms of approach criteria. Well, before I leave operational awareness, I always spend a little time on load sheets. Why? Well, because in my experience, when I um, am with somebody, either on his command course or um, when I'm given the sector away, PICUS, uh, and uh, they look at the load sheet and they hand it to me and I will say, what have you checked? And the result is nine times out of ten, it hasn't been checked. So it's worth just um, underlining some aspects. Now, DCS load sheets, DCS, the load sheet that you're going to get in your hand created by the computer um, 99 times out of 100 almost these days. The operations manual in two parts, three parts, that I immediately come to mind, describe how you're going to check a DCS load sheet. In flying crew orders, you, commander, have 
authority to delegate some responsibility from the air navigation order that you are responsible for checking that the aircraft is properly loaded. And if you read that, you will find that, needless to say, it says you can't possibly run around and check everything. So therefore, you are allowed to accept various parts of your supporting team to provide you with the proper loading of the aeroplane so that in effect what you're doing is confirming by checking the load sheet that you've got a properly loaded aeroplane. Now DCS won't produce a load sheet that is that doesn't work. Well, that's the first thing. The Load and Balance Manual. Load and Balance Manual describes load and balance in great detail, and will provide you with the information of um, how much a particular catering uh, load weighs, and what its uh, trim effect is, and so on and so forth. How much a normal crew weighs, and so on. What the standard passenger weights are. What the baggage weights are, and so on and so forth. But, in addition to that, in the back of, or in the appendices to flight quarters, you will find a very useful little diagram of how to check a DCS load sheet. And that's what I'm going to ask you to do. Look at it, and find out. And make sure that whenever you get handed a load sheet, you are properly checking in accordance with the requirements. If you do that routinely, again, it becomes habit, and you will pick up that somebody's given you the wrong virtue, or it applies to the wrong aircraft, or whatever. And even if it isn't your sector, there's no reason why you can't pick it up and check it. And again, that will put you in a subroutine that stands you in good stead for your own command. It's quite useful, however, as far as the DCS load sheet is concerned, to know what changes the issue number. And basically, the issue number, in simple terms, changes for anything that an operator can put in manually. So, that is why when the the dispatcher comes up and looks around and oh, he says, oh, there are three of you today, I thought there were only two. He doesn't bring you a new load sheet because that would change the issue number. Similarly, the trip fuel changes the issue number, as does the total fuel and the taxi fuel, as does the catering. So anything that is put in manually will change the issue number. And that is why it's so important to check those items that you will see, if you like, in bold in the appendices of fine crew orders. DCS load sheet. Now, one of the things that happens to you on occasion is that when you're least expecting it, you'll be handed a manual load sheet happens very rarely, but when it does, it's usually at ETD minus three, and when it happens, you can see immediately whether or not somebody knows how to check a manual load sheet. Now, what I suggest is that in a quiet time, wherever it suits you, you get a DCS load sheet, a load and balance manual, a manual load sheet, and you create a manual load sheet from the load and balance manual. And if you do that, you will find that if you do it correctly and it will work out, then you have created a manual load sheet and you'll now be, be able to understand how a manual load sheet works. Because after all, the computer is only reflecting what is in the load and balance manual, but in a computerised format. So, whilst you've been beavering around in the load and balance manual, great thing is you've made a number of discoveries, not only about crew weights, but also um, 
adult weights, male, female weights. And one of the interesting things is that when you get a provisional load sheet, you can ask why does the invariably the zero fuel weight go down when you get a final? Well, of course, on a provisional load sheet, the machine is using adults as a um, form of uh, getting the weight. But as it closes out, it does a male-female child split. And unless you've got an aeroplane full of Tongan rugby players, then the weight of the passengers will inevitably go down. Of course, you know, you might have had more cargo or more passengers or whatever that will increase the zero fuel weight. But given a fixed number of people, usually the zero fuel weight will go down when you get the final. However, back to our manual load sheet. If you go cast your mind back, right back, to a basic load planning, then the maximum payload that an aeroplane can carry will be determined by one of three things, won't it? The zero fuel weight, the takeoff weight, or the landing weight. And on our manual load sheet, in the right hand top box, you will see zero fuel weight, takeoff weight, landing weight, not in that order, okay? up here. And it asks you to calculate by bringing some the operational weight over here. The lowest of these three. Okay. And that that is the controlling weight. The controlling weight for the load sheet. Now let's just say, for the sake of argument today, the lowest of these three weights, and all you have done is follow the instruction, follow the instruction on the left hand side, and the uh, words written across there to find the lowest weight. Let's just say today it is the zero fuel weight that is going to control the maximum payload of our aeroplane. Okay. The zero fuel weight, the actual zero fuel weight, is down here in the bottom corner of the manual load sheet. And what we're going to do is a simple sum. Now the zero fuel weight, the actual zero fuel weight, okay, the actual zero fuel weight here, and it's important, before last minute change, before last minute change, very important that, is read off there. And here, there is something that's cal calculated as the underload. Again, You'll need to find this on the manual load sheet. But if you add the underload to the actual zero fuel weight, you will get the maximum zero fuel weight. And if you do, the load sheet works. So if you think about this logically, if the zero fuel weight was controlling the load sheet and you had no underload, then the actual zero fuel weight would equal zero fuel weight, wouldn't it? So what you're doing is saying that if there is an underload, if there is space on the aeroplane to chuck more payload, then that underload plus the actual zero fuel weight will equal the maximum zero fuel weight in this case. And similarly, exactly the same thing if the takeoff weight had been controlling or the landing weight had been controlling. So, at ECD minus three, when you're handed the manual load sheet, you look for the controlling weight. You go down to the controlling weight, in this case, zero fuel weight, you add the actual zero fuel weight before last minute change 
to the underload. If it equals the maximum zero fuel weight, the load sheet's checked. If it doesn't, hand it back. You have to redo it. Now, you will know if you've flown for British Airways for any length of time, it used to say that there was a requirement for you to check the basic weight and index. Now it says, of course, the basic weight and index is tied to the aircraft registration, which is true for a DCS load sheet, but it sure as hell isn't true for a manual load sheet. And for a manual load sheet, you do need to check the basic weight and index because you could have a, a load sheet that works but is meaningless because the basic weight is wrong. Okay, basic weight and index needs to be checked on the manual load sheet. Now, the important thing is that having checked the load sheet works, you're then looking at the passengers and the compartments to take them across to the trim sheet which you're going to check through which is part and parcel of the checking of this particular form of load sheet because the trim sheet is attached to but is different from the load sheet so if the load sheet works you check that the appropriate numbers have gone across to the trim sheet and then follow the trim sheet down make sure that your aircraft is in trim and then you have checked a manual load sheet when would you all oh, need to do this well um, the sorts of occasions that come to mind are that you're uh, out of it's hard, hardly conceivable today that you could be out of touch with um, the uh, with London so you couldn't get a load sheet and if you're doing a, a touch and go to drop off a, a, a you know, medical emergency or pick fuel up or whatever, you can use the nil change or small change of, of load sheet within the spare forms wallet. So you're almost never going to do this for yourself. That doesn't mean to say you can't, Commander. You may. And of course, m many of us that have flown in the outer parts of British Airways used to do this for six times a day. But if you know how the load sheet works, on those occasions when you have to check a manual load sheet, then it's easy. You only have to do this once and it will stick in your mind forever. And therefore, as I say, I really do recommend that you take time out to create a manual load sheet from the DCS information. And the two will marry up, and if you've married them up and you figure how that works, then load sheets are no longer a problem for you. <laughs>